the, the prayer uh, this morning. Uh, sorry, folks, we're a little bit late getting started, but technology uh, and uh, members availability and emergency sometimes get in the way. Um, if you wish to experience peace, provide peace for another. If you wish to know you are safe, cause another to know that they are safe. If you wish to understand seemingly incomprehensible things, help another to understand. If you wish to heal your own sadness or anger, seek to heal the sadness or anger of another. Dalai Lama. Okay, thanks. So, um, review and adoption of the agenda. We have one agenda item. Uh, today we've scheduled a uh, public technical briefing on the cumulative land disturbance framework for the Bathurst caribou uh, herd. And uh, there's a range plan that's uh, uh, that this uh, framework is found within. Um, of course, this is a meeting of the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment. My name is Kevin O'Reilly. I'm the MLA for Frame Lake, and I've been asked to chair the meeting today. So can I get a motion to um, uh, adopt the agenda as uh, presented? Uh, Mr. Johnson, thank you. Uh, no objections? Okay, motion. Uh, the agenda is adopted. Uh, any declarations of conflict of interest? Not seeing or hearing any, uh, we can uh, proceed with uh, the public part of our meeting. Uh, we're joined today by staff from the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. I'd like to start with introductions and we'll ask committee members to introduce themselves, starting with uh, MLA Johnson. Alan Johnson, MLA for Yellowknife North. Thanks, and I believe we have uh, Ms. Knuckleby on the phone. Yes, uh, Katrina Knuckleby, MLA for Great Slave. Okay, thank you, members. Uh, I'll now ask the uh, witnesses to introduce themselves. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, Brett Elkin, Assistant Deputy Minister of Operations. Uh, with me, I have uh, Heather Syene Crawford, who is the Director of Wildlife and Fish with ENR, and uh, Ms. Karen Clark, who is our Manager of Wildlife Research and Management. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Mr. Elkin. Um, I understand that uh, you have a presentation, um, and uh, just uh, so... Uh, we can try to run a, a smoother meeting. I'd ask that all uh, comments, uh, questions be directed through me and uh, um, that you um, request uh, uh, through me to be uh, um, recognized and then uh, we'll make sure that you're uh, heard. The, the meeting is uh, being broadcast on our social media channels, so this is a public meeting. Um, I would ask uh, Mr. Elkin then to uh, proceed with the uh, presentation and uh, we, our staff will make sure that it's up on the screen for uh, uh, our uh, members and for the public uh, to follow as well. for inviting us to provide an update on the Bathurst Caribou Range Plan with an emphasis on the cumulative land disturbance framework. Again, here with me this morning are Ms. Heather Sayeen Crawford, our Director of the Wallace Fish Division, and Ms. Karen Clark, our Manager of the Wallace Reproduction Management Section Management. As you are aware, many barren ground caribou herds across the NWT have undergone significant declines in recent years. The Bathurst caribou herd, in particular, has undergone a major decline. The GWT is working closely with our co-management partners, including Indigenous governments and organizations, to implement a wide range of measures to support caribou conservation and promote herd recovery. 
These actions include the implementation of the Bathurst Caribou Range Plan, which was released in August 2019, to help manage activities on the land in a way that supports recovery of the Bathurst herd. I'll now turn over the technical presentation to Ms. Karen Clark, Clark to walk you through. Thanks so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. The Bathurst Caribou Range Plan guides land use and resource development decisions made through the co-management process that may impact the Bathurst Caribou habitat across its range. The plan was approved in August 2019 by the Cabinet of the 18th Legislative Assembly after it was endorsed by the Wikipedia Renewable Resources Board as required under the Cleachel Agreement. Since 2019, we've been working on implementing the recommendations in the plan and the progress we've made on implementation will be the focus of the presentation. I'm just going to speak to the outline now. The presentation will cover the following items, a background on the Bathurst herd, its annual range, why and how the Bathurst Caribou Range Plan was developed. I'll go over the core components of the plan and the main management recommendations. Again, I'll be focusing on key implementation progress we've made since the plan was approved in 2019. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. This map shows the Bathurst herd's annual range, which spans the Northwest Territories, Nunavut, and Northern Saskatchewan. This means that herd management requires coordination and cooperation among all these jurisdictions and the peoples that rely on the herd. The hatched area near Bathurst Inlet is the calving ground. Other parts of the range are used seasonally as part of the caribou annual cycle. Next slide. Next slide. A range plan for the Bathurst herd was needed for a number of reasons. As mentioned earlier, the Bathurst herd has undergone a significant decline since 1986. In 2018, the Bathurst herd was approximately 8,200 caribou, a 60% decline from 2015, and a 98% decline since 1986. Barren ground caribou was listed as a threatened species at risk in the Northwest Territories and as required under the Species at Risk NWT Act, a recovery strategy for barren ground caribou was developed to guide recovery of the species. The range plan addresses, the Bathurst Caribou Range Plan addresses habitat protection actions listed in the NWT recovery strategy for barren ground caribou. The range plan also forms the basis of habitat management requirements in the Bathurst Caribou Management Plan. The range plan also addresses measures directed at the GMWT by the McKinsey Valley Review Board during the environmental review processes for Gatchaquay and Dominion Diamonds J project. The plan fulfills a requirement for the GWT to develop an approach to manage cumulative effects on the range of the Bathurst caribou herd. It also addresses concerns raised by Indigenous governments and other co-management and other co-partners. Next slide, please. Starting in 2014, a multi-stakeholder working group guided development of the plan. 21 organizations from NWT, Nunavut, and Saskatchewan participated. Participants included Indigenous governments and organizations, federal and territorial departments, environmental organizations, and industry as represented by the NWT and Nunavut Chamber of Mines. The GWT was represented on the working group by departments of ENR Lands and Industry Tourism Investment. The working group met 13 times over four years to collaboratively develop the range plan. The process used best available science and Indigenous knowledge to understand the current state and pressures on the herd. 
and recommended approaches to manage cumulative effects. ENR conducted two rounds of formal engagement with external parties and other GWT departments. What we heard reports were prepared after each round of engagement. Next slide. The overall goal of the Bathurst Caribou Range Plan is to ensure people and activities are managed to maintain the Bathurst Caribou Herd Range in a healthy state. The working group identified four main objectives to support that goal. Make sure the important parts of the range, such as calving grounds and key water crossings and land corridors, are not disturbed. Ensure the herd can move freely throughout its range. Develop thresholds for how much humans can disturb the range. And manage roads and traffic within the range. To achieve these objectives, the plan includes nine management recommendations, including a cumulative land disturbance framework. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The proposed plan includes nine management recommendations to address cumulative effects on caribou and their habitat, while also being flexible and adaptable for industry. The first recommendation is to establish a cumulative land disturbance framework and manage activities according to defined disturbance categories. The second to support Indigenous community guardianship programs, to foster traditional practices, and to monitor caribou numbers, health, and location across the range. The third, to consider a level of protection around important water crossings and land corridors. The fourth, to consider a level of protection for calving grounds and post-calving range. The fifth, to use mobile caribou conservation measures in the area of core caribou use to reduce disturbance when caribou are passing through. Six, when developing new, new roads in the Bathurst Caribou Range, consider best approaches to road construction, routing, and traffic management to reduce impacts on caribou. Seven, use compensatory mechanisms, such as habitat restoration, to make up for impacts to caribou habitat. Eight, identify important patches of mature forest in the winter range that can be considered under ENR's value at risk approach to fire management. And nine, use online staking to reduce sensory disturbance to caribou associated with helicopter supported staking. That is currently part of the New Minerals Resources Act and several years from being implemented. I'll now go into a bit more detail on most of each of these recommendations. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The cumulative land disturbance framework provides a way to assess the amount of disturbance on the range and then apply a progressive set of management actions as the amount of disturbance increases. The disturbance framework establishes three categories of range disturbance, healthy in green, which indicates low levels of disturbance, Cautionary, Cautionary in yellow, in indicating yellow, moderate levels of disturbance, of disturbance and high risk and in high red, risk in indicating red. high levels of disturbance. Levels of disturbance. Essentially, all the recommendations in the plan apply across the range, but their intensity is increased as the disturbance category moves from healthy to cautionary. 
Under the framework, different parts of the range are assessed and mapped using these three land disturbance categories. Targeted management actions increase as you move from healthy to cautionary levels. For example, best practices would be used in areas identified in the healthy category, while higher standards and additional measures would be expected in areas identified in the cautionary category. The ultimate goal of the framework is to help the caribou range stay below the high risk level. When the range reaches the high risk status, new disturbances would only be advised once active disturbances are minimized, removed, or reclaimed to ensure that total disturbance remains below the high risk threshold. Next slide, please. This map shows human disturbance levels on the Bathurst Caribou annual range. For planning purposes, the range was subdivided into five range assessment areas based on human land use patterns, administrative boundaries, and caribou habitat. Current development on the Bathurst range is shown, including communities, roads, mines, exploration camps, lodges, etc. The pink color shows the area around these features where caribou are thought to be disturbed. This is also known as the zone of influence. Based on amounts of total disturbance in the range assessment areas, they were assigned to one of three categories, healthy, cautionary, or high risk. As you can see from the map, 64% of the Bathurst range is currently in the proposed healthy category. Those are areas one, two, and three. 36% of the range is in the cautionary group. This includes area two, which is in the central tundra, where the existing diamond mines are, and area four, which is in the central winter range area that includes all of the communities on the range. Currently, there are no areas in the range in the high-risk category. Next slide, please. To implement this recommendation and manage total amounts of disturbance, we've taken the following steps. We've defined a process for conducting annual updates to the inventory of landscape change. This is a database that contains all the projects and associated disturbance on the range of the herd. We use these annual updates to track total levels of disturbance in each of the range assessment areas. We've also developed a species and habitat viewer, which is a website that allows users to see disturbance levels in relation to thresholds. And that website will launch in the fall. It also allows a user to add new potential disturbance to see how it influences total amounts. Total amounts. Next slide, please. The community guardianship recommendation was almost unanimously supported by all members of the working group. The program is meant to be a coordinated network of community monitoring programs on the Bathurst Caribou Range. It's comprised of all the Indigenous governments and organizations with members that harvest from the Bathurst herd. The program is being led by the Wakaji Renewable Resources Board. They've received three years of funding from Polar Knowledge Canada to support development of the Guardian Program. We're currently in year two of that funding cycle. Three workshops have been held to develop the vision goals, objectives, and a terms of reference for the program. And it's been named the Caribou Guardian Coalition. The initiative follows the Indigenous Guardianship Toolkit which is an initiative from Nature United. And at a workshop held in January 2020, the working group learned about successful programs from elsewhere, including the Hamaya Stewardship Network, which is a network of First Nation territories on northern Vancouver Island and mainland BC. 
Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The plan recommends advancing habitat conservation in areas of important habitat. There's been significant traditional knowledge research undertaken by several Indigenous groups to document key water crossings and land corridors. This map reflects some of that work, and the areas are seen as important to maintain connectivity across the range for migrating caribou. In terms of progress we've made to implement this recommendation, we've held a series of four workshops in 2021 to advance and support work in this area. We've developed support materials to aid those groups that are just starting this work and background information on legislative tools that could be used to establish conservation areas. ENR is looking for possible funding sources to continue to support IGOs to work with their members on identifying and prioritizing important caribou habitat. We plan to bring the group together in fall 2021 to assess progress and next steps. Next slide, please. The range plan recommends using mobile caribou conservation measures to reduce sensory disturbance to caribou around exploration projects. Mobile caribou conservation measures are a flexible tool used to minimize disturbance while allowing for industrial development. As caribou approach an exploration site, project activities can be modified, reduced, or stopped in response. Appropriate responses are triggered by the distance and number of caribou detected in an early warning zone around the project site, the size of the early warning zone and the threshold number of caribou is based on seasonal sensitivity and movement rates of caribou. ENR has developed a framework document which describes the intent of mobile caribou conservation measures and how they would operate. We've also developed an operational guidance document for companies that are running camps that might need to implement mobile measures at their site. These two documents are currently under review. We attempted to pilot mobile measures in the fall of 2020 with Aurora Geosciences. They're a company that operates five exploration camps on the central barrens. Unfortunately, their camps were not fully operational in 2020, and the pilot project turned into a desktop exercise. It's currently being written up. Another pilot will be conducted in the fall of 2021, when hopefully those exploration camps will be operational. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Compensatory, mechan Compensatory mechanisms are ways to make up for or compensate for impacts that cannot be avoided. These could include habitat restoration, for example, or support for research and guardian programs. ENR is working on the following items to support implementation. A report on implementation options, which includes consideration of three main approaches a developer-led approach, a fee-based approach, and a third-party organization, which would lead and coordinate compensatory mitigation. The second item supporting implementation of this recommendation is a GWT guidance document on offsetting for caribou. This document will advise developers and regulatory boards about when offsetting is appropriate, what should be considered, and what type of off offsets might be acceptable. Thirdly, the GNWT is finalizing an offsetting plan for the Quicho All Season Road. This plan is particular to boreal caribou, but may have some information or guidance that is applicable to barren ground caribou. Next slide, please. Next 
Managing roads and traffic was a key objective of the range plan and forms one of the nine recommendations. Under the basic set of management responses for habitat areas that are healthy or in the green zone, the plan recommends to use best practices, consolidate corridors, time construction to occur when caribou are absent, and use appropriate construction techniques to facilitate crossings. Under enhanced measures are areas that are in the yellow. The plan recommends that traffic is managed through restrictions and convoys during certain time periods that might be sensitive to caribou, and that suppressants or other techniques should be used to manage dust. With respect to implementation of this recommendation, ENR is working with the Department of Infrastructure to develop a best practices manual, including additional options for mitigating impacts resulting from roads. We've also supported a master's project on caribou movements, behavior, and level of stress hormones around the Gachoque mine site, including the Spur Road. This work will help us understand caribou responses to roads, barriers to movement, and potential options for mitigation. Both these pieces of work will be important preparatory steps as we move forward with the Lockhart all-season road. Next slide, please. In summary, the main progress we've made on implementation of the range plan includes getting tools in place to allow us to track and manage on the basis of cumulative disturbance levels. This includes annual updates to the inventory of landscape change and developing an interactive website that informs users of the plan, its thresholds, and how a project will add to total disturbance levels. We've advanced work on habitat conservation. We're providing funding for IGOs to work with elders. We've held four workshops with Indigenous governments and organizations to talk through what we mean by conservation. We've developed support materials and hope that we can find resources to support those Indigenous governments to continue to work with their members. For the Caribou Guardian Coalition, we have three years of external funding. We've completed two workshops and have another plan for fall 2021. Sorry, that was three workshops, apologies. We've developed a vision, objectives, terms of reference, and support materials. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. With respect to implementation of mobile caribou conservation measures, we have underway a GNWT framework document, an operational guidance document. We have another pilot planned for the fall of 2021 with ongoing collaboration with Aurora Geosciences. For implementation of the recommendation on compensatory mechanisms, we're developing an implementation options report, GNWT guidance document, and finalizing the Cleacho All Season Road Offsetting Plan. Lastly, for road management and planning, we will continue to engage with the Department of Infrastructure to document best management practices and additional mitigation options to reduce impacts to caribou. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. That's the conclusion of our presentation today. Thanks so much for your attention. Emily O'Reilly, just uh, unmute your mic, please. 
thanks. Sorry about that. I have two buttons to press. Uh, I think we're ready for questions from committee, and I note that Ms. Knockleby, uh, you have a question. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, I have to run. So I just wanted to make a, a quick comment. Uh, I think what uh, you presented here today just shows or is a good example of our great uh, environment and regulatory regime in the north that we often talk about. And, you know, it gives me a lot of uh, faith that, you know, the caribou are being looked at and things are being thought out. So I, I really um, am pleased with this presentation. I just guess my question is, and I heard this from industry as well, the online uh, mapping or staking programs, uh, you know, I never thought about it as well from the disturbance to the, the wildlife in that area. So I know they're keen to get it. Is there a way that uh, perhaps it can be facilitated or sped up to get to that level? I know we probably need more funding, but I'm just curious to know what the department thinks we could do to, to accelerate that. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ms. Knockleby. I'll, I'll let Ian R go ahead, but I think that's probably a, really a question for ITI, but um, Mr. Elkin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, yes. My answer will be the same as the chair's. I think it's a good question, and I, we would defer that question and the answer to uh, the department to provide insight on their path forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Mr. Elkin. Anything else, uh, Ms. Knockleby? Sorry, still muted. Uh, no, thank you very much for that, and thank you for the presentation. I do have, I have to mute, because I'm going to be driving soon, but uh, I'll, I'll listen on in. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Ms. Knockleby. Uh, Mr. Johnson, do you have any questions? Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to all the staff at the ENR for the presentation. I, I think this is really good work, and uh, you know, um, I just appreciate all the work that's been done to date. Uh, I wanted to kind of step slightly out of the range plan and just, uh, I was hoping someone from the department could provide me a, a sense of uh, the, the legal harvesting that happened this year on the Bathurst caribou, whether we have any updated figures on how many caribou were illegally harvested and uh, or how many charges were laid. Because I think that's one of the problems. We can do as much range planning as we want and, you know, enough buy-in with the Indigenous governments and industry, but if we can't prevent illegal harvesting, we're really not going to, you know, make the conservation efforts we need. So any update that could be provided on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Elkin, are you able to address that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I understand or I know our minister provided an update to his cabinet colleagues at the end of the season with at the end of the harvest season, the winter road is closed for the year. So we uh, and where the caribou are, we are not having harvesting at this time. So the last email that was provided to uh, um, MLAs is current. Uh, unfortunately, because we have some cases before the court, I can't speak to any further detail uh, other than uh, Certainly, we spent last winter, we enhanced our enforcement along the winter road with the support of our co-management partners. So it is a priority for us and all our co-management partners to reduce the illegal harvesting. But in terms of details at this point, I cannot speak any further. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thanks, um, Mr. Elkin. Um, Mr. Johnson. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, the other question I had was in regards to the, the wolf management and predator control. I note that's not in one of the recommendations, and I know Wikizi has expressed some concern about this previously. Um, can I just get a, a sense of how the wolf management fits into this plan and, and fits into our plans going forward? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Elkin? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's sometimes, I guess, from the outside, there are multiple approaches and guiding documents that guide how we deal with uh, barren ground caribou management with our co-management partners. So it's a good question. I think we need to think of our response. I'll give a high-level response and ask uh, Ms. Heather Zayn Crawford to give some detail. Um, we basically tier our response. At the territorial level, we have a recovery strategy that guides all of our overall actions for barren ground caribou. We are developing a new, a revised uh, management plan for the herd, which covers basically all aspects that affect, the, that affect the herd and how we respond to them. Basically, this range plan, in my mind, nestles underneath that. So it helps address 
the land management aspect to feed into the Bathurst Caribou management plan, which feeds into the herd recovery plan. So wolf management is one of those key factors. Essentially, what we've been trying to do over the last few, uh, last decade with our co-management partners is address all those factors that affect caribou that we have some direct control. So it would be human harvest, uh, predators, uh, land use, including the range plan. So at a high level, it certainly falls into that big umbrella. I would maybe ask if uh, Ms. Cyan Crawford can add some detail to that. Thanks. Um, I guess the only the only thing to add there is, is just that... Um, I know that when we start talking to the public and, and, and communities that there are sometimes some confusion about, about the number of plans. And so um, these plans are all nested within each other. So Karen, when she first introduced the, the range plan, was talking about the NWT recovery strategy for Barren Ground Caribou. And within that recovery strategy, it asks that herd management plans be developed for all of the herds in the NWT. So as uh, Karen has been working diligently with um, members of the Bathurst Care Blue Advisory Committee to uh, finalize the Bathurst Care Blue Management Plan. And as um, Mr. Elkin uh, mentioned, uh, under that management plan is where all of the other Bathurst uh, plans fit. So the Bathurst Care Blue Range Plan speaks to the habitat uh, the wolf management proposal that was developed with the Kucho government is, uh, um, speaks to the management actions for, for predator management, which was a recommendation or is a recommendation under the Bathurst Caribou Management Plan. So there are multiple tiers and multiple levels. And um, obviously with caribou management uh, and wildlife management, there are, there's a ton of information and a lot of work that's being done. So there are multiple plans that deal with aspects of, um, of all of the work that we are doing. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, uh, a lot of plans, and uh, I think I got that straight, but uh, um, Mr. Johnson, anything further? Uh, yeah. I guess uh, apologies to staff and that I, I, I'm not really too clear on the plans. I'm going to ask just general questions about the Bathurst Caribou, and I, I'm not sure which plan it falls under. Uh, I, I, my other question was, I, I noticed they are presently risk, uh, listed as threatened. Um, can I just get a sense of how, what the trigger would be to go to the next level under the Species at Risk Act? And... Um, kind of how we evaluate, you know, listing one specific herd as threatened as opposed to an entire species. Um, is that analysis done on each of the herds individually? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, so I'll turn to uh, Mr. Elkin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll try to keep a high-level short answer, and then we can add some detail from Ms. Sian Crawford if uh, that will help. The process of listing species uh, under the Species at Risk Act in the WT is done collaboratively through the Conference of Management Authorities. And the initial, the first step, I'll take you back, I'll walk you through the, the process. The first step is uh, a group called the Species at Risk Committee, which is independent experts, uh, uh, both science and traditional knowledge, that review the uh, species and recommend at what level they believe uh, the species should be listed, if at all. Uh, I like their criteria compared to some of the southern criteria is the difference between endangered, threatened. Uh, it, they look at, is this, could this species disappear in our current lifespan? If uh, we land you in endangered, would it disappear in our children's lifetime? Could it disappear in our children's lifespan if it, we don't take further action, which is threatened as you where we are? In terms of the specific criteria, that is more challenging. Sorry, before I get into the criteria, we list at a species level. So the species at risk is intent on will we maintain a species uh, within the Northwest Territory. So that is what the species at risk and the territorial legislation, ter territorial uh, recovery plan looks at. The reason that we also nest uh, herd specific plans is herds have uh, strong fidelity to use certain areas, so the, thus are accessible to the communities uh, that by, that they pass on their annual range. So we, we manage at a herd level because it does impact uh, not necessarily the whole species recovery. Uh, that For that, you have to look at all herds, but it certainly could impact 
which caribou would be available, say, on the Bathurst range to communities that have traditionally harvested it. So the decision to list is made based at a herd wide, a species wide basis, and the criteria will vary. Uh, there, it's not a set number. They need to look at total population trends. There's many factors. So with that, I don't know if there's much more detail, but I'll turn to Heather Saying Crawford to maybe add some uh, detail on those criteria for listing. Um, there's not a whole lot more to add. So just maybe the one thing to, to talk about is the recovery strategy was uh, released in 2020. And in, uh, according to the CMA, um, after five years of implementation of the recovery strategy, there will be a reassessment and looking at, at how we are implementing all the actions within that recovery strategy. And maybe the other addition is that the federal species, um, federal um, process is underway to, um, to look at whether they are going to list their ground care or not. So that may be another, um, uh, another process that, that it is another process that everyone here in the NWT has been involved in and looking at, and we expect uh, some communications out from the federal government on their decision for listing soon. Okay, thanks. Um, I guess I'm going to try to squeeze a couple of questions in if I can, and then I'll, I'll go back to uh, Mr. Johnson. But um, just to uh, follow up on... Um, uh, Mr. Johnson's question about uh, harvesting. Uh, I understand that some of this, of course, is before the courts, but I guess I would urge the uh, department to um, make some effort to communicate to the public uh, what happened in the, the last uh, harvest and uh, um, release some numbers if possible. Uh, I think a public update is really required. I, I've got constituents who've raised this issue with me. And uh, um, I guess at some point, both whatever harvest is happening by Indigenous peoples and illegal harvest has got to have some impact on um, the ability of the herd to uh, recover. So um, I guess... Uh, is that factored into the cumulative effects disturbance framework in any way? Um, so anyways, a, a couple of questions there from Mr. Alkin, one about how to communicate a little more clearly to the public what's going on and how harvesting figures into the, uh, the disturbance framework. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and I appreciate the comments because that certainly has been an important area of discussion with our co-management partners and our the leadership from our minister and our deputy minister ha this year has been to try to increase our public messaging. We're trying some new approaches. I'm hoping that uh, folks are finding it effective uh, through social media and others to get more information out on uh, illegal and disrespectful harvesting than perhaps we have in the past. So I'm hoping we're having some effect and we're always open to look and say, how can we do better? So that is a message I can relay back to the department to encourage how we can do that. There are obviously, we work closely with Department of Justice and we have to be cautious with uh, when are on specifics for legal cases, but that is certainly our interest to increase our public uh, information so people are aware of uh, what is happening out there. Before turning to the uh, disturbance framework question, which Karen Clark will be in best suited to answer, uh, I would like to note one thing I didn't mention before is uh, the deputy minister uh, has also taken a strong interest in hearing back from our co-management partners, respected harvesters. We're in the process of working with our indigenous governments organizations who harvest on the Bathurst range to set up a, a initial meeting where we'll hear from respected harvesters. What are those challenges? Why? Are, are we seeing disrespectful and illegal harvesting, uh, even if it's a low level? And what do we collectively do? This is a shared resource and this is a shared co-management process. So why, why do we think this is happening despite all the information that's available publicly and what can we do to encourage uh, people to harvest respectfully? So certainly will be a priority for us moving forward. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And with your permission, we'll have Karen Clark answer the second question on the uh, disturbance framework. Thank you. Um, thanks for that question. Um, the the range plan and the cumulative disturbance framework were developed at what we consider to be a critical low point in the Bathurst caribou 
population cycle. So in that sense, it's meant to be very protective of caribou and caribou habitat. So it's not, the framework would not um, be responsive to say annual um, harvest levels. Um, however, the plan is meant to be reviewed every five years and updated based on current conditions. And in addition, the Bathurst Caribou Management Plan um, recommends that if herd um, status and trend change substantially, the range plan should also be looked at and those disturbance categories um, reassessed. So there's a couple mechanisms for reviewing that land disturbance framework and where we sit. One is within the range plan and the other is within the management plan. Okay, thanks uh, for that. Um, maybe I'll squeeze one more in. Um, you know, I, I don't take issue in any way with all the work that you folks have done. I think it's a very logical process that you've gone through in terms of developing the range plan and uh, the, uh, you know, working with partners and developing the, the nine recommendations and so on. The, the, I think the problem, though, is with uh, the implementation and getting it done in time. <laughs> and that's not something I think you folks really have a lot of say over, uh, because at the same time that, you know, uh, the Cabinet has adopted this plan and uh, implementation of it, um, you know, we, we keep chugging along with a, the uh, Lockhart uh, all-season road or the Slave Geological Province corridor. Uh, and I just don't see how uh, the uh, two are compatible uh, in any way, particularly when the, the Bathurst caribou are at such a low level. I guess I thought that this presentation was really going to focus much more on the uh, framework itself, the scenarios that were developed, how close we are to the high uh, um, level of disturbance and what happens when we get there. Uh, because I, and you know, have we actually, so maybe my question is, have we actually run scenarios that include the Lockhart all season road, the uh, Tulsa and hydro expansion, uh, other proposed activities, and what happens to the disturbance levels with those, uh, with in that kind of scenario, uh, does it do the disturbance levels get into the the high area, and if so, what is going to be done about that? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. For that detail, uh, I'll ask uh, Karen Clark to provide you some detail. Thank you for that question. Um, we have done scenario modeling and we had responded with a lot of that information previously to SCETI um, just even a month ago, if that. So the information is there. Um, what it does show is that Yes, those projects were considered in future development scenarios. Um, if all current development were to stay on the landscape in addition to those new scenarios, it does take us over the um, high threshold um, for a short period of time. What we stated in that response earlier back to Sketty was that um, what that scenario hasn't considered is the range level mitigations that are proposed in the Bathurst Caribou Management Plan. Things like mobile caribou conservation measures, things like um, convoying traffic, um, um, and things like compensatory mitigation or offsetting. So what we would put forward is that um, while that scenario may have taken us temporarily over that threshold. There are things that we can put in place that would likely prevent that exceedance of the threshold. And those are all the pieces that, that really were talked about um, in the presentation that we delivered. 
I guess the other thing to consider in this scenario modeling is that, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the future. So we've done our best to look at reasonably foreseeable developments, and, and we worked very strongly um, with industry partners and, and ITI partners to be as accurate and, and realistic as possible. It's still not, you know, it's, it's a scenario. So we really don't know exactly what's going to take place, um, but we feel that with the mitigations in the range plan fully implemented, that we can manage those, those impacts. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, I'm just gonna say two words, precautionary principle, but I'm gonna turn it over to my uh, colleague, uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you. I, I was hoping to get an update on whether any of the plans foresee any changes in how we uh, manage harvesters going up the ice road. Uh, I guess my preference would be that we simply close the ice road, uh, but I, I know that that's probably a lot easier said than done. Management partners would not be supportive of that. But uh, can I just get an explanation or an understanding of whether like a mandatory in and out is anticipated or, or whether any changes to how we make sure we're monitoring uh, harvesters on the ice field are, are anticipated through any of the plans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, um, Mr. Elkin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that question, MLA Johnson. Certainly a good one and one we thought about and talked about with our co-management partners prior to this season. Uh, in the last two years, we have seen some illegal harvest, as you're all aware, and we're really trying to get at what drives that and what can we do to discourage it. We can do enforcement once it occurs, but the ultimate goal is to uh, prevent it from happening for obvious reasons I won't restate. We made some changes this past year. Uh, we, increased, we went from two check stations to three. Uh, we supported... Uh, uh, the Clicho and the Yellow Knives to have monitors out in the road to interact with harvesters uh, to try to do that within the compliance model, the front end work, the education, the encouraging people to uh, support the rules that are in place for all of us. So we put the, we increased our efforts this year both in the prevention and the response once it occurred, uh, and we've been uh, taking advantage of full our. Uh, enforcement abilities this season when things did occur. I think your question gets at, again, what else can we do? Obviously, as you allude to, there have been discussions on, on how to manage access to the road, which is, as you know, a challenging issue. because It has to be used for operational purposes, and there's many other things to configure. But that discussion on what we need to do for next year, knowing what happened this year, is Part of the reason that our deputy minister uh, and our minister want to get out and talk to Indigenous governments and, and hold this Indigenous uh, Respected Harvesters meeting is talk to our partners. What Here's what we've been doing. What else can we do as ENR? But what can, what can our partners do and what do they think will be effective at getting what we believe is a relatively small number of people who are not uh, harvesting legally? So I think that will be part of this uh, meeting process this summer, both at the respected harvester level and uh, in the fall, so hopefully some uh, leaders meetings with our minister to talk about how we do, what can we, can we do different for next season. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Mr. Elkin. Mr. Johnson? Yeah, no, thank you for that. And I, I guess I just want to pause and say that I, I thank you to all the ENR staff. I, you know, I, I think you did a the enforcement team did a great job. The comms team did a great job. And I, I and I know that the vast majority of harvesting is respectful, and I, I speak to those harvesters regularly, and they are just as upset as anyone else uh, regarding the legal harvesting. So I, I think this is very much an, an issue of a few people, and we're, we're all trying to solve it together. Um, but my on to a different question. So with this updated range plan, can I just get a, a high level explanation of how it would change any proposed uh, geological routing? Uh, the current routing, I believe, is, is based on economic value. And I, I note that we have now identified a number of key water crossings and a number of key habitat zones. But has this 
ultimately changed any routing or, or how would it, this go about changing uh, any routing for the proposed road? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Elkin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, with the Chair's permission, I'll turn that question over to Karen Clark. Thank you, appreciate that. The um, most recent routing that um, was developed with Department of In Infrastructure um, included wildlife information. So we worked to provide them with the information that we had um, on sensitive caribou habitats, seasonal ranges, um, and, and even you know other information like wolf dens and raptor nest sites, that sort of thing. So we scoured our databases and provided inf information to infrastructure that fed into the routing analysis. Um, we will continue to do that as additional routing analyses are conducted. Um, you know, we're currently updating um, our barren ground caribou uh, range use information through resource selection functions, and that'll be um, also very important information provided to that analysis. I think it's worth saying that um, the Indigenous uh, knowledge that has been collected is owned by those Indigenous groups, and the sharing of that information is up to those Indigenous governments. So we do not, um, we do not have access to um, the water crossing information or the land corridors, and that information would be shared only um, by those Indigenous governments that own that, that data. Okay, thanks, uh, Ms. Clark. Uh, Mr. Johnson? Uh, I have no further questions. I'll uh, review the plan in more detail, and just thank you to everyone for all your hard work. Thanks, uh, Mr. Johnson. I, I've probably got two or three more if I could. Um, I'm just wondering how the concept of habitat restoration um, will actually work above tree line. You know, I, I understand, say, with uh, boreal caribou, how cut lines, there might be some way to uh, um, use or lower the widths of cut lines in the future, put dog legs in them, uh, maybe uh, enhance uh, some uh, revegetation and so on. But uh, how does habitat restoration really work above tree line? You know, I, I visited the three diamond mines. I've seen some of their efforts at uh, uh, reclamation. It's very, very slow. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can never return an area to its previous use or productivity in any way, so especially above tree lines. So how is this going, you know, how do we actually, if we exceed the high um, disturbance level uh, with some of these scenarios, how can we actually restore or reclaim habitat in ways that are going to allow um, for those disturbance levels to be lowered and caribou to uh, properly use areas? Thanks. And I, I I'm not sure whether that's uh, for Mr. Elkin or Ms. Clark. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's a good one, and it's one that we are really looking into ourselves. So as you mentioned, in a forested landscape, you can envision how habitat restoration might take place through um, you know, tree planting and or other um, methods uh, that restore vegetation. On the tundra, that's much more difficult to achieve. Um, I guess what, you know, how we are trying to address that very question is through um, the guidance document that is being developed this fiscal. Um, that guidance document will look at whether we can actually feasibly restore habitat on the tundra um, and, you know, if we can, the other thing I guess that factors into habitat restoration and offsets is um, whether it can be achieved and then whether, you know, one, if you disturb one unit of habitat here, 
is it equivalent to one unit of habitat over there? So there's a fair number of considerations um, that we're hoping to get guidance on and clarity on over the next year. The, the reason why we talk about that recommendation in the range plan, we, we talk about it as compensatory me mechanisms. And that's precisely to allow us the flexibility to think about other ways to, to make up for impacts. So compensatory mitigation could include things like investing in research, for example, to help us maybe develop some better reclamation or restoration revegetation techniques on the tundra. Compensatory mechanisms could also include investing in guardian programs and things like that. So it's an acknowledgement that pure offsetting and habitat restoration may not um, actually work very well on the tundra. In the taiga, yes, and the forested areas do make up the winter range of barren ground caribou. So um, yes, a number of considerations, and uh, we hope to work on that and get guidance on that over this winter. Yeah, okay, no, thanks for that. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think we're entering into some very interesting areas, like, of course, uh, Fisheries and Oceans has had their no net loss policy for years, and, uh, it, you know, ways of classifying fish habitat and all that stuff. But when it comes to terrestrial habitat uh, for something as complex as caribou, I think this is new ground. And, look, I think uh, what you folks are doing is... Uh, very good work in this area, but uh, I'm just uh, I'm very worried about the, the timing of all of this because uh, Cabinet is chomping at the bit to get funding for the uh, uh, Slave Geological Province Corridor uh, and wants to submit a project probably in the next year or two to the review board uh, for uh, its consideration. So, yeah, I, I'm just very worried about the timing of all of this. Uh, you know, there's been no uh, no actual um, habitat protection other than thigh bene nene, which was set up for other kinds of reasons, I guess. Um, and I know that there's some workshops and meetings and things going on around habitat protection, but even something I thought as simple as the uh, caribou conservation measures which are kind of modeled in some ways uh, on the old caribou protection measures that were used in the Kavalik region in the 70s and 80s, we still haven't been able to do this as a government. Um, so I, I'm just very worried about the timing of the habitat work vis-a-vis uh, -vis our government plowing ahead with the uh, Lockhart all-season road. I just I can't see that the work coming together in time. Um, and certainly for my view, and this is my personal view, is that cabinet, there's very little political will to protect caribou. Uh, and if a choice had to be made between the Lockhart all season road and caribou, the, car the road is going to win. So, um, sorry, and th I, this is a political question, uh, uh, or that's political discussion, but how are we going to bring together the, the timing on the uh, habitat work that's needed uh, in time to get that work done before Lockhart All Season Road uh, enters into an environmental assessment and is approved. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I would start by noting that our approach to the to a lot of the topics within the range plan and the habitat protection, I think. We've made some really good progress, uh, as the MLA notes. There's still lots of work to do, and this is a complex issue. I think perhaps the reason we've taken some time to get where we are is I think it's really important that we get the best available science, learn from what was done before. We've been, uh, our various team members, led by Heather and Karen and a bunch of others, have been trying to build partnerships to do some of the science. We're building partnerships with communities uh, to uh, get perspectives and traditional knowledge. So I think we actually have made a lot of progress. It is timely, and I, I understand the uh, concern. Um, maybe I'll turn over from an applied basis to Karen to give a little bit more detail, but I think we all sense the need to 
tackle this uh, challenging question as as quickly as we can. So I think we are making progress. It may not, not always be apparent. So maybe I'll turn to Karen for some technical perspective of on the ground of how we make progress on this. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, with respect to road development in particular, um, you know, the, the guidance pieces we need that would help us implement those aspects of the range plan can be, can be developed in time. Um, it's really bringing together um, the information on best practices and options for mitigating, convoying, um, that sort of thing. And there's lots of, lots of um, good examples out there to draw from. The other pieces, as you mentioned, you know, habitat conservation is not something that is easily fast-tracked. Um, you know, the partners identified the need for some sort of flexible protection around water crossings and land corridors. The, the tricky part, I think the stumbling block for us is that there's so many water crossings on the landscape. It's really hard um, to, to come up with defensible criteria, I guess, that allow us to prioritize. And so I think that's what we're really struggling with right now. And, um, you know, we have a contract underway to tease out water crossings from our caribou collaring data set. And, that, and, and you can do some really interesting technical analysis to, to look at how many times those crossings have been used um, since we've had uh, collared animals. Um, you can also look at the number of animals that use that crossing at any one particular time. So from a technical science perspective, you know, we're, we're working away on that. It's a different question when, when you know, we're, we're talking about it from an Indigenous knowledge perspective and, and an understanding of, of how caribou use the landscape. So it's, it's a process that is meant to respect both knowledge sources um, and come to agreement on basically a short list of what should be protected. And so it's not an easy task. But um, I would say the group is very dedicated and very interested in making progress. And, you know, on mobile caribou conservation measures, we have made a lot of progress. It, it might be, um, you know, internal to us at, at this point, but we're getting to the point where we will be in a position to more publicly share information and get feedback. And we've been very, very fortunate to be working with Aurora Geosciences and as a really knowledgeable, experienced industry partner that has the on-the-ground understanding of how camps run, how you know, drilling programs take place, how those operations progress through the mineral cycle and how those activities change over time. And, and they have been key in helping us identify um, what kinds of um, things can, like what kinds of industrial activities can we reduce, um, can we halt for short periods of time? So those are pieces that we will be in a position to, to share, hopefully, um, in, in the next um, six to eight months. And I think we are making progress. You may not see it yet, but, but stay tuned. Um, and I think I would just leave it there. Thank you. Okay, no, thanks uh, very much for that. And lest my comments be uh, misunderstood or misinterpreted in any way, I want you folks to continue to do the good work that you're doing. Uh, my concern is at the political level that this is a very complex set of issues. And uh, from what I've seen, compromises tend to be made uh, at the political level that um, are not favorable to caribou and uh, our track record hasn't been very good as a, as a species uh, on this planet when it comes to wildlife management. But uh, look, uh, very, I wanna thank you folks very much for your uh, presentation today and encourage you to continue to do the, the good work that you do. Uh, Mr. Johnson, I don't believe you have any further questions. No. Okay. Nope. Thank Thanks. You, uh, 
Thanks very much for uh, the uh, time today, and we look forward to the reports that, that uh, you mentioned, the ongoing work, and um, you know, working closely with the Indigenous uh, peoples and governments as we continue this uh, work on caribou. So uh, we're going to ask our uh, guests to uh, sign off, and I believe we'll probably go in camera for a very uh, short uh, uh, debrief. And thanks to the public for watching as well.